Well, thank you for spending your valuable time joining us. I am really excited today to introduce you to Gina Zapanta. Welcome, Gina. It is so great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And we're going to be talking about negotiating past cultural money trauma to empowerment, both in the legal profession and beyond. And for those of you who don't know Gina, she's an attorney, a podcast host. She's co-founder of ZA Lawyers. Gina Zapanta has been an advocate for employers and injured people for her entire career. But the thing that really caught my attention as well is outside her law firm, Gina's passions include addressing education and food insecurities in underserved communities, as well as empowering women uh, and others to step into their power without guilt. She does tremendous work in the community, and I'm really excited to dig into the conversation. So starting off, Gina, tell us what, uh, what attracted you to the practice of law? Well, I come from a family of doctors, and I realized quickly that I'm not good at science or math. <laughs> It's not a it's not a romantic beautiful story. I, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut. I just was obsessed with astronomy growing up. I just yeah. borderline probably a weird kid about it and I went to the University of Southern California, wanted to major in astronomy, but astronomy 101 taught me very quickly that I don't have what it takes as far as math skills. I love that. <laughs> it was funny. So I quickly pivoted and ended up was recommended law school by the Dean of the International Relations School, which is what, one of my majors. Nice. And literally just said, well, that sounds like a good idea because I also knew medical school was not, it wasn't yeah. something that spoke to me. Yeah. Well, hats off to that guy for, for making no that kidding. recommendation. That's lovely. And I was laughing because I had the same experience. I thought I wanted to be a psychiatrist. And then I heard you needed a medical degree, which involved math and science. I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> I am tapping out. <laughs> it's it. not my forte. Um, no, I really love that you weaved into your practice of law and frankly, beyond into your community. You know, you've done such interesting things to give back. So I'd love, tell us a little bit about your pilot program with East LA Community College. So thank you. So we have our firm, ZA Lawyers. We're based in California and in Louisiana, where my husband's from. And we had the idea that because we have, obviously we're successful lawyers, we do quality representation, excellent work for the community. But with that, we believe comes the responsibility to reinvest in the community. And being that we have the resource and feel that it's our responsibility to do so, one of the things we've done is created these, it's called the ZA Lawyers Legal Leadership Institute. Yeah. We go to local community colleges where I think that's prime time for students to really decide if they want to go the legal route or not. They they have opportunity, but at the same time, the people that attend the community colleges usually come from socioeconomically depressed areas. Yeah. And I understand the value that representation matters. And so to see someone like me that maybe looks like them might give them some hope to realize that they don't necessarily need to go to paralegal school or case management. They actually could become the lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so that was the idea behind it. And so we are in two community colleges right now, and I'd like to spread the program further and just continuing to create space and opportunity where it's not usually yeah. available. I think that's so beautiful. And I think it helps because I mean, the practice of law can be very soul sucking sometimes. So I imagine, do you, do you find that doing this kind of generous work outside helps keep you inspired and fired up in the practice of law, Gina? So my, my journey in law is the road less traveled. I don't actually practice the cases. The firm is in my name. I'm a silent partner, if you will, but I do all the marketing, all the operations. I do all the behind the scenes. That's my superpower. And I learned that. And we have phenomenal lawyers in our firm who their superpower is creating and, and building these beautiful cases and seeking justice. Yeah. But because of that, understanding that the type of work we do, we are dealing with people who are at a disadvantage, they're hurt, they being have been taken advantage of by the system, their employer, whatnot. Yeah. It, it, as you know, it's heavy, it, it yeah. weighs on you and you feel like there's so much need and there's so much that needs to be done. But yes, our answer yeah. to that addressing that is creating these opportunities. I love that. And what a great for our listeners out there too, whether in the legal profession or, or beyond, what a great way to think. We sometimes have these boxes where we feel like we need to fit into particular practice areas or business models. And I love how you thought outside the box and yeah. create something that works for you. Now, is it's it really that thing? scary? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I love that. I think that's a great opportunity for people. We, we tend to be very narrow in our beliefs about what's available out there instead of creating what we want, create the vision we want. 
And is it that same passion that inspired you? I understand you did like a hundred and a hundred thousand dollar endowment for a first generation yes. Latina to attend law school. Tell us. Yep. So at my alma mater, uh, Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, uh, my husband and I established an endowment for a first generation Latina to attend law school. Again, uh, statistically, there's less than 2% Latina lawyers across our, the United wow. States. And so again, doing my part, it's my responsibility yeah. with my research, with our ability to open the door because the door is slammed shut. Affirmative action was just basically yeah. erased in our country. And so, yeah. you know, I can't change that in a day, yeah. but I certainly can establish scholarship and find a way around it because it, it's unreasonable and, and you can't keep people out that oh. are capable. 2%, I did not realize the number. Less than 2%. That That's yeah. insane. Now, and one other thing, before we get into the nuts and bolts, like as a writer myself, I was so intrigued that you did a children's book. And not only that, but it was on this unusual topic that is so often overlooked for kids because we don't think it's appropriate. Everybody assumes it's over their head. So t tell us about your children's book, Magic. So it's called 10% Magic. My husband and I wrote it. And the idea behind that was, in realizing we're dealing with communities that are at a disadvantage. And we looked into it and we said, what is it? What is the base of it? And ultimately in all of our communities, it is a lack of financial literacy. Yes. We understand that the system is set up to not educate us yeah. about financial literacy because that creates freedom and opportunity. But that being said, since that's, again, since it's not available and we can't change that system, we will create a way around it. We will create opportunity and access to the education yeah. the best way we know how. And we're not financial experts, but we do know enough more. So like what, what's a credit card? What's a FICO score? Yeah. How do you tip at a restaurant? You have to understand the audience that is intended are people who yeah. have not necessarily been around these very casual, normal things in most of our lives. Yeah. And what age is the book targeted to? Um, I would say tweens. Yeah, I love it. I, I thought it was a brilliant idea. And, and I want to dig into this money trauma concept yeah. as well. Because, you know, I grew up in a low rental apartment complex and you just don't have access to a lot of things, not only financial literacy, but I know starting university, nobody in my circle had ever been to post say, and I was having to figure it out as I went and law school, everybody's got these contacts and connections. And I'm just like, I do not, <laughs> I do not have that advantage. So let's That's talk about- story. Yeah. Well, and I'd love to hear your perspective on cultural money trauma. Like, what is it? How can we overcome it? So I'm Mexican-American. I'm Latina. And culturally, uh, I think in a lot of communities of color, or, or it's actually not even color, it's more socioeconomic communities. I don't care if you're green. Yeah. If you grow up <laughs> in a certain socioeconomic demographic, you're not going to have access. You're going to have a certain mindset about money. Yeah. Fast cash, you know, we get it and we buy the thing and in those communities, it seems that the goal or what they're aspiring to or validation will come from the new car, the new purse, the new thing that your nails are always done, your hair is always done. <laughs> but you, you see, like, it's just very fast cash, yeah. you know, earn it and burn it. Yeah. And there's no emphasis on wealth building and yeah. what that Pandora's box conversation actually means. And why would there be? There's nobody... Yeah reinvests in that conversation or introduces that conversation. Yeah. And so the money trauma comes from just cyclical mind poverty mindset being taught over and over and over generationally. Every now and then you have some that break through and break the mold, but it's still not enough. Yeah. So by introducing concepts like you save your money and then the money you you don't save your money because savings is for losers. The money yeah. you make, you <laughs> invest it in an asset or some sort of vehicle that will yield a profit or something. And from that, that then you can maybe spoil yourself. Yeah. There's this mentality. And again, I think it's just lack lack of understanding it and, and having these conversations because people are smart. People are capable. Uh, they just don't know what they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think as you were saying that, it really struck a chord with me. There's there's layer on layer behind this as well, because even for those who break through, if you can call it that, there's that guilt around it or that 100%. money baggage. And it struck me. I remember like the first time I got, you know, I grew up with nothing but used cars. And then when I finally got like a caddy Escalade, 
Oh. I would show up for my hearings because I serve and sort of I did social justice law. So I served typically that underrepresented community. And I would show up at the beginning of the hearing and I would be embarrassed about my vehicle and drive around the building to park in the back. And it took me a long time to recognize, oh my gosh, this ripples over. I undercharge my clients. I don't own my own value. Oh. So I'd love it's to hear onion. your thoughts on that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's an onion. And I was not raised in that situation. My dad was an orthopedic surgeon, so I was raised very well off. Yeah. But interestingly enough, he was the first in his family okay. to have an education and his brother became a neurosurgeon. And so these two young Latino boys from East wow. LA come out. They are just a success story beyond. Like people didn't know they were unicorns. <laughs> yeah, I bet. But I distinctly remember, and I appreciate you saying that, that we would have family meetings and now as an adult, I can see my dad was struggling with so much guilt yes. of being the first, like you said, yeah. we lived extremely well. And so to us, we didn't know that was our baseline. Yeah. <laughs> but I saw, now I see how he struggled and he put a lot of guilt on us. And I remember comments like, you should never think you're better than the garbage collector's child. Oh my God, and that I'm just was my like, dad. <laughs> and I'm just like, well, I don't, like, what do I know? I'm just like, I don't, I don't think that. Yeah. But he just kept hammering that kind of mindset. And so even now, as having means to have nice things, I still struggle. I'm like, well, I shouldn't get that purse or I shouldn't go on those vacations. I yeah. shouldn't do, shouldn't. Yeah. And yeah. Just walking through, there's this guilt associated with it. Like, well, other people don't can't do that. And you don't want to be a show off. <sighs> What are we doing all this for then? <laughs> what are we doing? Okay, fine. Yeah. Then let's not do anything. And then let's not show up and let's not have anything. Does yes. that make us feel better? <laughs> <laughs> but I love that you do this work about money trauma and that you call it money because it really is a form of trauma. And I remember it doing is. a money exercise once where they would shoot at you. I don't know if you've done it where they'd go, money is boom. And you had to right off the bat and you'd go through this whole thing and then switching the words, rich is this, wealthy Ooh. is this. And so many of my answers showed that deep conditioning, you know, money is greed, right? Money Ooh. is extravagant. And so it had to do a lot of work on that sort of money trauma. And Whereas you, money is freedom. Money is access. Yes. Yes. Money is opportunity. Yes. I love that. So what are some other, throw, throw some others at us here so that for our listeners, what are some ways you can take a look at how you currently perceive money and maybe uncover some of the layers of money trauma you may have? What are, what are some other more positive spins on it? Well, absolutely. I think the language is at base. That is the foundation because yes, we have our external conversations, but the internal monologue that goes on in our head reinforces these philosophies and mindsets that we didn't come up with. They were taught to us. Yeah. <laughs> so if you see it and look at it in the eye for what it is, yeah. you want to have that, you want to have that extravagance, stop sentence, period, back up, define extravagance. Yeah. Okay. Defined. Now, back up even further. Why is that an extravagance? Who told you that's an extravagance? Yes. Like, why do you have that mind? Yeah. Because you, you didn't come up with it on your own. You learned that from someone. Yeah. Well, it's because in my community, if I show off, people are going to think I'm too good for them. And they're going to say, you know, they're just showing off or you're, well, aren't you trying to not be in that community anymore? Uh -huh. Aren't you trying to elevate and grow? Yeah. And it's just so compounded yeah. and there's so much, but truly if you, it's something everyone can do is the greatest equalizer is having the internal conversations and it takes work and it doesn't yeah. feel good. And it's shocking yeah. when you, when you consistently stop yeah. yourself, you're like, holy crap. Yeah. Yeah. You've been living like a robot and like suffering yeah. because of it and you don't have to. Yeah. And look at the way you live your life. What a great example as well about the good that money can do. I mean, you've got a hundred thousand dollar endowment. You have these internships, you're giving back to the community. You've got books out there. I mean, there, yes. there are tons of ways that when you allow yourself to get into a position where you have the resources, where you have some power, you can give back to the community in unexpected ways. And I mentor a lot of students, a lot of students, and this is absolutely one of the things I tell them, what you just said. I tell them I'm in this game to be a billionaire. I am in this to make money. And then I stop. And then you just see like, because <laughs> even saying that right now, you're probably like, but you get it. Cause you're already, like, I get it. Still, uh, yeah. still triggered some part of us. Oh yeah. Saying it. I'm just like, you know, no, yeah. I am absolutely in this to be a billionaire. One, why not? Because I can. Yeah. Something no one has ever told us yeah. Two, because my money I now have power. 
Yes. Money is power. Money is freedom. Yeah. I can hire people to do things for me, which yes. frees up my time so that I can do what I want. Yeah. I can be a mom, a wife, a per- yeah. exercise, vacation, whatever. Yes. Yeah. I do all that to community, to elect officials. Yeah. It's beyond me, you know? And I love that you mentioned about time because again, it took me a long time to get over it. I did a lot of driving for my work back and forth to the city or, you know, out of province, out of state. And I finally got to the point where I'm like, this is crazy adding up all of those hours where I could be productive and doing other things to generate. So I started hiring somebody to drive me and I got, you know, five hours a day of extra time to be able to create and make a difference. Now, really, we- and I do the same thing. I have a driver. And, and oh my gosh, what a game changer. And it just seems so decadent to me. And that goes back to that sort of money trauma, that cultural baggage, that class baggage, if you will. <sighs> Now we've talked about power a bit and I know I love, again, you've just got so many balls in the air. I think it's beautiful. You've got an empower hour movement. I think you invite women in particular sort of shun those cultural and societal trauma. So it, tell us a little bit about what that looks like and some steps for our listeners. What, what can they do or what steps can they take to shed some of that trauma? Sure. So I started the Empowered with Gina platform. It originally started as Empower Hour, where where I would host these Zooms in COVID for an hour once a week, just as a place for people to connect and talk and for me to be around community. And it has morphed into this platform where I've pivoted away from the firm. It's running, but I am now investing in scaling the Empowered with Gina brand, which I have a membership uh, model, as well as retreats and events. And we talk really about facing your life because I can tell you right now, most people, the majority of the people listening to this feel overwhelmed, yeah. feel anxious, feel like they can't keep up, feel like oh, I just need, I just need twin, uh, two more hours in the day, three more hours. <laughs> in the day. I wish there was another me. I can't keep up. <laughs> Next year I'll do it. Yeah. They have that thing in the background that they've always wanted to do. And it speaks to them. But there's no way they can do that. They have kids and they have a, you know, a partner and they have this and they have da, 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 da. everything else before them. Yeah. I was very much living that way yeah. and I went through my journey in life and fortunately had my awakening. And now the core of this, my entire platform is accountability, realizing that life happens for us, not to us. Yeah. And one thing, if I, if your listeners can take anything away to change their day, the second you open your eyes in the morning and that stress is just like, bam, you open your <laughs> eyes and you just feel the day already. Watch your language. You don't have to do, I have to do this today. I have to do this. Oh, I have to do that. You get yeah. to do these things. Yeah. That one tiny word yeah. absolutely changes the paradigm yeah. and the mindset. Yeah. And it's just a tiny little trick, but yeah. the only way it'll work is if you consistently, repeatedly do it every hour of your life, for the rest yeah. of your life. Days are going to be better than others. Yeah. That's what happens. I love it. And it's just getting intentional, right? Getting more intentional about choosing who we want to be, how we show up, the things that we're grateful for. Who you want in your life. And that yes. includes family. I also say blood is not oh. thicker than water. Oh, yeah. people get mad at me about that, but try to change my mind. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I didn't choose the family. I was born into yeah. it. And then I was told I yeah. had to tolerate toxicity, show up. And even though I, all of it, no yeah. more, nothing's wrong with oh. us by saying no more. Oh, and thank you for calling that out. Cause family is such a touchy subject and people, there's so much guilt and conditioning around it. And often it's our family with the best, <laughs> sometimes with the best of intentions. They're the worst ones. They make us question ourselves and they, <laughs> they think they're keeping us safe, but they are holding us back from stepping into the most powerful versions of ourselves. So thank you for calling that out. I, Happy to. I, I love that. Now, what are some of your favorite sort of life skills? I was going to say for professionals, but I'd say for professionals and beyond. So you've given us one tip about, you know, when you show up that first thing in the, in the morning, when you wake up rather, any other favorite life skills you've got to share? the power of your breath because that stress will creep up out of nowhere or it's underlying and we feel out of control. We feel like life is happening to us. We're just trying to keep up the intentional thought process, getting to do something versus having to, and then physiologically forcing your body into a focused state. It takes seconds. It takes seconds. The power of our breath is so underrated. It's free. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> it adds minutes to your life by doing this. It's yeah. proven, you know, yeah. it reduces cortisol levels. We're yeah. good. 
Yeah. And for our listeners, I challenge you, just try it. Because I used to poo-poo that idea. But if you're feeling particularly I, overwhelmed, just take that moment to, to control your breath. And you will realize how quickly and profoundly you feel differently. It's and if you don't know how to do it, guess what? Everyone has this t- this thing at our fingertips, glued door, YouTube. <laughs> Quick breath exercises. Yes. You're welcome. Yes, that's so true. <laughs> Even just box breathing, right? Four I in, think. hold for four, four out, hold for four. It does not get any simpler than that. <laughs> it changes. It changes yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. And especially in conflict situations, even I often say that in negotiations, you know, whether with your significant other or your kids or in a big business deal, when you're about to get reactive, just take a few seconds of deep breaths to be able to ground yourself and remind yourself who you want to be. So such a a beautiful tip. I do have one more just to carry with them. Failure is the way. We have been taught that if we fail at something, it's an embarrassment. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm, yeah. And you own that you live with that failure. You lead yeah. with that failure. You're limited by that failure yeah. versus I attempted it. I executed it and it yeah. didn't work out the way I thought it would. Oh, I love Big it. deal. You <laughs> did it. What did you yeah. learn? Failure is a lesson own it. I am more successful than most people because I fail more than most people. Yeah, I love fail that. quickly and often. Yeah. <laughs> I fail. We fail more than we succeed. That's why we succeed. Yeah. It, it's, it's another something we weren't taught. Game changer. A big game changer. I have a friend who called them fail abrasions, which I love. Oh. And, you know, my kids are in their twenties now. If I had it to do over again, and you say you've got a two-year-old running around there. So I would every night at the dinner table say, what did you fail at today spectacularly? And what did you learn from it? And celebrate those failures. So we change our conditioning. I thought that was so beautiful. What did we (laughs) fail into today? Yes. So good. Now we've been talking about life skills for success. And I think in part, it depends on our definitions of success, which I sort of have had been having a series of mini epiphanies about. So I'd love what, what does success mean, mean to you, Gina? Peacefulness. Mm, Beautiful. Yep. No matter how high or how low or whatever it is, I am successful if I'm able to maintain peace, a peaceful mindset, yeah. despite the curves that life throws us, which is often. Yeah. How can yeah. I not be triggered? How can I not take things personal? How can I not be offended? How can I not be hurt by that? Yes. How can I not removing the ego allows us to be peaceful? Oh. And so that's success to me. Oh, that is so beautiful. And speaking of ego, because I I do think our current systems are very ego driven. We've been so conditioned to be driven by that ego. Do you have any tips on how to manage big egos or strong personalities to find more creative solutions to get those better outcomes, especially amongst diverse personality types? So you mean in, in dealing with people who have big egos? Yeah. When you, when you're approached by people with, with that sort of big ego mentality, which I think is sort of the condition, most most people define success based on that very competitive model and show up from that very ego driven place. Any tips you have on how to manage that to get to more outcomes? Again, I'm only in control of my mindset. Everyone can be, you know, uh, introvert or the biggest narcissist we could ever meet. If I understand that everyone is literally doing the best they can with what they have, whether it's that introvert, that asshole, (laughs) whatever. Yes. They are literally doing and behaving and acting the best way they know how in that moment. Yeah. And if it doesn't align with what I believe they should be doing, it's not, I mean, I can judge them and I probably do, but (laughs) then I catch myself because again, we're trained to do that as part of human survivalism. I think I catch myself and I take the, my ego judgment and the stinging criticism that maybe comes with that. (laughs) And I empathize and I create the empathy by saying, wow, where are they in their life that they feel they have to come in like this or come in and put others down or come in and just be a jerk? Yeah. (laughs) What must that be like to be in that space? Like, oh, poor person. And I also realize I have a very strict line and I won't tolerate more than a certain amount of that. Like if it's business, sometimes you have to deal with that. But then also, do I really want to be doing business with someone like that? I don't care how good the money is. It is not worth selling my soul and my peacefulness. I won't do it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's so, and so, so in line with, with my beliefs, you know, I, I call it the art of feminine negotiation, but it's that idea about just 
bringing empathy to the table. Stop seeing these so-called soft skills as a liability. They're, it's our it's our superpower. They're the superpower exactly. Yes. This, is, love- this is our superpower. Use yeah. it. Nurture yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. And would it be the same advice for dealing with bullies? Because we have talked sort of about cultural trauma and sort of populations that don't have the kind of visibility and I think are more likely to face sort of bullies or bullying people with more power. Any yeah. tips for how to approach that? Again, it's the same thing. This is not rocket science. Yeah. These concepts are, look, they are available for everyone. It's just, if you're willing to put the work in yeah. now, if you're surrounded and they might not be like these overt bullies, the worst ones yeah. are the like undercover ones with the passive aggressive comments yeah. or the ones underhanded, you know, backhanded compliments. Yeah. That again, goes back on you. Why is that person in your life? Yeah. Stop crying about it. If they're a jerk to you and you know that cut them out or yeah. have a serious <laughs> talk to say, I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. You do it again. I'm out of here. It is not easy. It is hard to walk away. Yeah. It is called self-protectionism and it is called yeah. growth. Congratulations. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so beautiful. And again, for our listeners, I want you to really take that message home that, you know, this is a couple of times now Gina's talked about that curating your environment. Like you get to control that to a very large extent. You get to decide who's in your inner circle. So you know, I invite all of you, take a look at your inner circle. And if there are not people there who inspire you, who lift you up, who make you want to be the best possible version of yourself, then maybe it's time to do something about that, that yes. inner circle. So yep. it's beautiful. Absolutely. Beautiful. Now, what do you see as the key sort of skills or hallmarks that make for a great negotiator? And when I use that term, I, I think all of life is a negotiation. So whether right. it's negotiating your intimate relationships or uh, your, you know, big business deals, what, what do you see as some, we, you've talked about empathy. I assume that's one yes. of them. What, what else would you suggest? And again, remove your ego, approach any negotiation, whether it's business or just anything, yeah. understanding that this is not a personal attack on you. That person is in that position trying to do the best they can for themselves. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. They're not trying to attack you. They're not trying to hurt you. They're not trying to undervalue you. Now, if you're a position at work, perhaps where they're undervaluing you, well, then that's just basic economics. That is black and white. You are not getting paid what you believe you're worth. You prove your case. They don't value you. That again, goes back to you to decide if you want to tolerate that or look elsewhere. Not easy, but you have a way out. Yeah. That's so good. And mm-hmm. I, a lot of what I hear under what you're saying too, is about getting curious, right? I, you know, I, I call it the art of fascination. Like when you're faced with that bully, you say, okay, what caused them to be this? Yes. I, I love your approach. You don't fall apart. And we're like, I'm hurt. I, that's yeah. so, I don't deserve that. Get that word out of your mouth. It's not about deserving. Yeah. It, it's not. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just get curious. And what do you see as the key reasons negotiations fail? that people be- lean into their ego. Well, th- yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to tolerate that. Yeah. I am. I am not going to put up with that. No. <laughs> so <laughs> take a step back. Yeah. Try to remove yourself from the situation. Yeah. Try to be so unrelated so that it's just a black and white decision. Yeah. Like you got to give and take a little bit. It's okay. Give, take, yeah. you know, you don't burn your bridges ever. My dad taught me that. And it is something I continue to work on yeah. all the time. <laughs> because I'm fiery like a Latina. And so, you know, I get, <laughs> bam. <laughs> but that's my journey. I, I choose every day to be accountable yeah. because I know I've been conditioned and trained to react and be, yeah. you know, that way. So, yeah. oh, I said, we, we have such parallel views about this. I love your perspective. I, you know, I often say ego, ego attachment and reactivity are one of the, you know, three Ooh. of the seven deadly sins of, of negotiating and showing up in business. First. Now, I know you've got a hard stop today and uh, you have, I appreciate you've packed so much value into such a short time for us. I normally like to end by asking, what's one of the greatest mindset shifts that you've ever had in your life? It doesn't even have to be about what we've been talking about. Just one of those aha moments that has you think differently, show up differently. When I had my daughters and I realized that I was responsible for what a little girl, little girls would understand is their baseline for self-love yes. and what one should tolerate in life. Do we tolerate good enough or we have one life, the clock is ticking. We're going to go for it. We're going to fail forward and we're going to keep going. Oh, that is gorgeous. Oh my gosh. What a beautiful messaging. And I love when you said daughters, because I think for women in particular, from a very young age, we're conditioned to play small, keep ourselves small, right? We, we don't have the room. 
you, you just see the, you should meet them. <laughs> it's so good. As I say to my clients, I make them do a brag list, you know, write down to it. And when I'm doing workshops, it is amazing to me, Gina, I'll ask them to list 25 things that they love about themselves. And invariably half the room sit there like deer in the headlights. Insane. It's insane. Yes. Like hesitant or not able to see it in themselves, a combination of the above. It's incredible. So where can people learn more about you? Tell us, and we'll make sure to put all of these in the show notes in terms of your, uh, your book and your programming, but uh, tell Thank us you. where you want people to go. So primarily two places I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok too, but mostly Instagram. It's called empowered with Gina altogether, G I N A. Yeah. And then my website empowered with Gina.com. And you'll learn about the membership, the retreats, my events, uh, and it's, it's such a beautiful community and it's a collective of like-minded aligned women who are truly getting curious and finally making the moves instead of just thinking about it, instead of scrolling continually and getting inspired by those quotes that make you feel warm and fuzzy, <laughs> they're actually taking the baby steps yeah. to make the change in their life. And so yeah. I'm super grateful for this community. Oh, that's beautiful. And so needed. We need to be talking about this more. So I encourage you go join the community, get in the thank conversation you. and be making a difference. So thank you so much, Gina. This has been lovely. It's been a pleasure having you here. Likewise, Cindy. Thank you for having me. And I'm sure for our listeners that you guys have got loads of value from this, make sure to read, listen. We covered a lot of ground. We were all over the map here with some great tidbits for living a better life. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done that already and give the gift of sharing. Share this episode with people that you think could benefit. And frankly, these are really important life skills. So anybody can benefit from that. And before we sign off today, I just wanted to share some ways that we can work together. If you're looking to practice law with greater purpose or to improve your firm's culture and productivity, I've got everything from group to my signature one-on-one -on -one programs and experiences available to help you better leverage your innate power and that of your team to be able to get more of what you want and deserve in life. If that sounds interesting, check out our website at practicingwithpurpose.org. And that is a wrap for this episode. So until next time, go forth and find ways that you can practice on purpose and find a better way to practice law so that you can rekindle your passion and make a difference in the world, negotiating your best life on your terms. Until next time, take care. 